So in the last module, we talked briefly about the first postulate of quantum mechanics. The first postulate of quantum mechanics basically told you that if you want to know anything at all about the state of a physical system, you need to be able to understand what its wave function is. Okay, that was basically the gist of the last lecture. So today we would like to go, uh, continue and ask the question, what can we do with this wave function? So remember that we mentioned that once you know the wave function, you can extract all kinds of information that you want about the physical system. So we want to be able to expand on this particular line to try and understand how is it that we can extract information about the system uh, given this one object called the wave function. So our uh, task for today would be to try and understand what can we do with the wave function. Okay, all right. So at a very basic level, one can understand that given some function, uh, what we can basically do is we can try to make it into some other function by operating it with some object, okay? So the goal of today's module is to try and introduce the notion of, notion of operators, okay? So we want to introduce the notion of operators. Operators are those mathematical objects that act on wave functions to give us something new, okay? Now, there is no difference between what I just said and what you're already used to. Uh, basically, you take something and you act it on some function f of x and you get something else, okay? But we want to be able to develop certain formalism. And to develop this formalism, it turns out that it's actually uh, rather illustrative before we move on to the uh, notion of wave functions to simply understand uh, the algebra of these operators in terms of things that you're already very familiar with. And so this is just an illustration for uh, the purposes of today's lecture. And we can understand what these operators are and how they act on these wave functions in terms of these very simple objects that you already know. These are vectors and matrices. Okay. So everybody is used to the concept of vectors and matrices. For example, in um, two-dimensional uh, space, uh, I can write any vector v in, in Cartesian coordinate system as the x component of that vector plus the y component of that vector, right? And I can always write a two by two matrix, matrix for example, I don't know, two, five, three, eight, right? And I can actually do a multiplication of this matrix and this vector. Okay, that will introduce us to the notion of what operators are. So before I move on, though I'm introducing these vectors and matrices for illustration purposes, there is actually a very deep connection between vectors and the notion of wave functions that we already developed, okay? So quantum mechanics is actually formulated in what is called a linear vector space called the Hilbert space. Uh, we will not <clears throat> uh, explore this deep connection between uh, linear vector space and wave functions in this particular course. But if someone is interested, I'll be more than happy to take this up during our live discussion sessions. Okay, so what are these vectors and what are these matrices is something that you already know. So let us develop the notion of operators uh, in terms of these matrices and vectors. Let us take a very simple operation. The simple operation is a rotation in a plane, okay? So let us say, that um, I'm living in the x, y space, okay? So this is my, let us say, um, so let me also make it explicit. So it's a three-dimensional space. I'm only living in a two-dimensional subspace of it for now. So I'll call this as my y-axis, this is my z-axis, and this is my x-axis, okay? Now, when I say I'm doing a rotation, um, I should say I'm rotating about which axis. So let me rotate around the z-axis. Rotate around the z-axis, which means the rotation happens in the x-y plane. So how does this rotation look like? Suppose if I take any vector v, 
right? Let us say that the vector is lying completely along the x-axis. Now, if I rotate it by some uh, angle with respect to the z-axis, this is going to have both an x component and a y component, okay? Uh, so, I can write any vector that has been rotated by an angle theta in the xy plane. Uh, and I can call this new vector as b prime, okay? Uh, this is the rotated vector. Okay, and of course the V prime is going to have new a new X component and a new Y component. And I think you probably already know that the new X component of this V prime is related to the old X component and Y component via this relation. V Y sine theta. And the new Y component of this guy would be uh, minus Vx sine theta plus Vy cosine theta, okay? When I'm rotating it by an angle theta. So this is uh, hopefully something that you're already familiar with. Uh, if not, we can also take this up during the tutorial sessions. Now notice that these two equations I can write in terms of a very nice matrix form. If I put this Vx prime and Vy prime as a column matrix. And I write this very simple looking two by two matrix. I can interpret these two algebraic equations, equation one and equation two, as a matrix equation, where, wherein I say that this column vector multiplied with this matrix is this column vector is equal to this matrix times this particular column vector. And this matrix I can write as cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, okay? So if you do the matrix multiplication, you would actually understand that Vx prime is cosine theta times Vx plus sine theta times Vy and so on and so forth. So I can now have a new interpretation for this act of rotation the act of rotation is basically an operation that takes every vector that lies in this two-dimensional space and gives me a new vector that also lies in the same two-dimensional space, okay? It doesn't throw it out of the two-dimensional space that I'm working with. It doesn't uh, give it a new Z component, for example. It still only has an X component and a Y component, but it has a different X and Y component. So I can write the same equation as V prime, the vector V prime equals some R times the vector V. And this R with a hat on it is my symbol for an operator, okay? So this is a vector. This is also a vector and this is an operator. And I will denote an operator by a hat. So matrices act as operators in a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional or a four-dimensional or a general n-dimensional vector space. Okay. So many of the things that we will learn about operators uh, turns out are also true for uh, matrices and this makes our study a little difficult. Of course, there are some things that are actually uh, a little curious. We will expand upon those as we go along. So the same uh, kinds of um, uh, things that are applicable to um, matrices are also applicable to general quantum mechanical operators. For example, if I have two matrices A and B, let us say I have two matrices A and B, okay? Now, I know that in general, in general, if I multiply A and B this way, and if I multiply them the opposite way, in general, these two are not the same. Okay, AB minus BA for two matrices AB minus BA in general is not equal to zero, okay? Which means that in general matrices don't commute. Of course, there could be a set of matrices that do commute for which the order of multiplication doesn't matter. But in general, the order of multiplication of matrices does matter, okay? I cannot blithely claim that A times B is the same as B times A. So this is again something that we would see in quantum mechanics. Uh, so we can also, you also know some basic operations about matrices. So um, for example, in general, 
in general, if you have a matrix A and some vector V, um, A times the vector, so A times the vector in general gives you a new vector. Yeah, A times a vector in general gives you a new vector. And this new vector cannot be, may not be very simply related to the old vector. It can also have a very complicated uh, dependence on the components, just like the rotation vector right here. But there could also be a special set of vectors such that for that vector, A times uh, that vector is simply the same vector multiplied by some number. Okay. In other words, there could be a special set of vectors which under the action of this matrix only have all their components stretched or compressed by the same amount. Okay, so if I write it more carefully, you can write this as some lambda times v. In general, lambda can be complex also. This equation is something that you have already seen, and this equation is a very important equation and is called the eigenvalue equation. Okay. And the numbers lambda are called the eigenvalues of the matrix. And the vectors V, there could be more than one vector. In general, there is the same number of vectors as the dimension in which we operate. The vectors V are, as you know, the eigenvectors. Okay. And there is a procedure to calculate this uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the way you calculate the eigenvalues, of course, you know this is by looking at what is called the characteristic equation. Okay, and you solve the equation, the determinant of A minus lambda I equals zero, where I is the identity matrix. Okay, for example, in two dimensions, I would be one, zero, zero, one. Okay, in general, in n dimensions, it is an n by n matrix with one along the diagonals and, uh, and diagonal and zero everywhere else. You solve the eigenvalue equation, you get the eigenvalues and you plug the eigenvalues back in the eigenvalue equation and you solve for the eigenvectors one by one. Okay, now we can also ask if um, the, these eigenvectors are perpendicular to each other. Now how does one define perpendicularity of two vectors? one defines that by looking at what is called the dot product of two vectors. And this is all basic uh, middle school stuff. If I have two vectors, V1 and V2, I can define what is called the dot product of these two vectors. I'm belaboring these points because I want to extend these uh, definitions to functions also as we go along. V1 dot V2 is given by the definition of course is the absolute value, uh, magnitude of vector V1, magnitude of vector V2 times the cosine of the angle between them. Of course, the length of a vector is a non-zero positive quantity by definition. So v, uh, modulus of V1, modulus of V2 is non-zero. So if V1 dot V2 is zero, it necessarily means that cosine theta is zero or theta is 90 degrees. So if V1 dot V2 is zero, we claim that the vectors are orthogonal to each other orthogonality implies theta is pi by two, okay? Or uh, perpendicular to each other. So when two vectors are orthogonal, we say that uh, V1 dot V2 is equal, identically equal to zero, okay? Now we can also go ahead and normalize the vectors. Okay, suppose if I have some vector V, out of this vector, I can create a new vector which is V vector divided by the length of V vector, okay? This new vector that I have created, excuse me, this new vector that I have created has unit length by construction, right? Because this is a constant and the length of the vector V vector is basically this. So this by this is equal to one. So the length of this vector V, v vector divided by the length of V vector is equal to one and if such a vector has, uh, if, a, if a vector has unit length, it is called normalized, okay? 
So suppose if I have a bunch of vectors, v1, v2, v3, and so on, and they are all mutually perpendicular, all mutually orthogonal or perpendicular, and all normalized to unity, which means all their lengths are normalized to unity, then I can claim that I have a bunch of ortho normal vectors. Okay, ortho normal means all the vectors in my set have unit length and they are all mutually perpendicular to each other. Now it's a little difficult to envisage such a collection in, I don't know, more than three dimensions. Even in three dimensions, it's difficult to envisage uh, Imagine three vectors that are mutually perpendicular. Ijk is a very simple example. But when you go to four dimensions and five dimensions, it's difficult for the human mind to comprehend this. But as a mathematical fact, this is certainly valid. That there could, for example, exist a five dimensional space in which I can construct five mutually perpendicular vectors, all of which satisfy uh, the normal normality condition that we wrote down in the previous page. Okay. All right, so now, um, it turns out that there is a special class of matrices uh, for which the eigenvectors are automatically orthogonal to each other. And this class of matrices is called Hermitian matrix, okay, again, uh, I'm sure you have seen this before. Uh, to understand what a Hermitian matrix is, you need to first introduce the notion of the adjoint of a matrix. Okay. So suppose if I have a matrix A, right, out of this matrix, I can Suppose if this is a complex valued matrix, which means its entries are in general complex numbers, I can create a new matrix whose entries are the complex conjugates of this matrix. And then I can take this matrix and I can transpose this matrix. Okay. And this complex conjugation followed by transpose has a special symbol. It's called the DAG. Of course, the order of complex conjugation and transpose does not matter. So this is the same as transposing the matrix first and then complex conjugating its elements. Now, if A equals A dagger, such a matrix is called a Hermitian matrix. For example, if I take some matrix, um, let us say 2 plus I, 4, <coughs> uh, 3I, and uh, I don't know, I plus 1. Now, first I transpose this matrix. The transpose of this would be basically 2 plus i, 3i, 4, and i plus 1. And then I take the complex conjugate of this matrix, and that will be 2 minus i, minus 3i, 4, and minus i plus 1. Okay, so clearly the adjoint or yes, uh, so equivalent they called as Hermitian conjugate is very different from the original matrix. So this has two plus i in the first one, this has two minus i. So this is a matrix for which the adjoint is not the same as the matrix, but there can exist matrices, and you can easily think of examples, for which A equals A dagger. Okay. If A equals A dagger, such a matrix is called a Hermitian matrix. Okay, it's also called self-adjoint. Okay, the adjoint of the matrix is the same as the matrix itself. So it's called a self-adjoint matrix or a Hermitian matrix. Okay? The Hermitian matrices have uh, two very nice properties. They have real eigenvalues and all their eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. Both of these uh, play a very central role in quantum mechanics and how they play a central role in quantum mechanics we will understand once we've introduced the second and third postulates. Okay? So, these are all very simple um, facts about uh, vectors and matrices that you, know, you are all very familiar with, uh, that matrices do not commute 
and the action of matrix on a vector is to give you a new vector but you can also write down what is called the eigenvalue equation of the matrix and basically solving the eigenvalue equation of the matrix and finding out the eigenvectors is uh, as i'm sure you know is uh, tantamount to diagonalizing the matrix out of every matrix as long as it uh, is non-singular i can always construct a diagonal matrix by basically uh, figuring out its eigenvalues okay so if uh, these prescriptions sound uh, strange to you we can always uh, put in uh, a couple of tutorial problems to help you explain to help explain uh, these these concepts okay so so much about vectors and matrices now we want to move on to quantum mechanics so we want to be able to understand how to apply these same concepts how to understand this notion of operators in quantum mechanics and based on what we already learned. So the objects that we have are not vectors, but rather wave functions psi of x. Okay. So I need to be able to multiply, and I use this word multiply very loosely, I will correct myself as I go along, something on psi of x to give, give me something new. So I will take an operator A and I will act this on psi of x. Okay. And I should get a new function, let us say phi of x. This is exactly the same, mathematically equivalent to a matrix acting on a vector to give you a new vector. Here I have an operator acting on a function to give me a new function. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, one is interested in the idea of what are called linear operators. So before we move on, we should clarify what linear operators are. Definition. So this is a very important definition, but it might also uh, look a little common sensical to you, but there are uh, things that are not that sort of are a little counterintuitive. So what is a linear operator? Suppose if I have an operator A, okay? So, so suppose if I have an operator A and I act it on a combination of two wave functions or two functions, let us say A psi one plus B psi two, okay? And I get the result as A acting on psi 1 plus A acting on psi 2 individually. So this is the same as A times A psi 1 plus B times A psi 2. Okay. And suppose if I have the same operator A acting on C times psi 1, this is the same as C times A psi 1, which I've already assumed in the first equation. If this property is satisfied, then the operator A is called a linear operator. Okay, It acts on the functions in a linear manner. It is called a linearity of the operator. Okay, So in order to understand how an operator acts on a combination of wave functions, it is enough for me to know how the operator acts on every one of the individual wave functions. So if I know how the operator acts on every one of the individual wave functions, I am basically done. Any combination of wave functions I can deal with. So why should I worry about this combination of wave functions? I should worry about the combination of wave functions because as we will see uh, as we go along, quantum mechanics is actually a linear theory. Okay. Suppose if psi1 and psi2 are uh, two wave functions, then A times psi1 plus B times psi2 is also a respectable wave function. So I will explain what this means as we go along. Quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics is a linear theory, okay? So to deal with the linear theory, it is important for us to understand what linear operators are. So now, what kinds of operators can there possibly be? Well, Trivial operators and what's called identity operator. Identity operator. An identity operator, we'll denote this by i hat, does nothing to a function. Okay, i times psi is just psi. This is like my taking a uh, unit matrix, right? So a unit matrix with just one along the diagonal does not do anything to a vector. So this is the uh, generalization of the unit matrix to a space of functions. So how do we add and subtract these operators? So 
we should be a little careful in the definition. So suppose if I have two operators, let us say A operator and B operator, okay? Now, operators by themselves are meaningless, okay? It is only when they act on some functions that you can say anything at all about the operator. So if you just gave me this is an operator and this is an operator, I won't be able to make head or tail of what you're saying unless I take these operators and act them on some functions, okay? So suppose if I want to add these two operators and I claim that the addition of these two operators is another operator, okay? Suppose if I claim that A operator plus B operator is a C operator. Now this statement by itself is a little strange because I don't know anything at all about operators. Operators are just standing there. They need something to act upon. So the only way I can justify this statement is if for any function psi, A acting on psi plus B acting on psi is identically equal to this operator C acting on psi. If this equation is true, this equation is true, okay? If for any random function, any random well-behaved function, A times A acting on psi plus B acting on psi is the same as C acting on psi, then I can turn this into an operator equation that says that operator A plus operator B equals operator C. The same goes for multiplication. If for every function psi, A times B psi gives me C times psi, then this implies that A times B equals operator C, okay? So if you want to know anything at all about operators, you want to act them on functions and try and understand what's going on. And just like the case of matrices, operators in general, uh, the order of operations also matters very much, okay? So what kind of operators can act on functions? Let us take an example. Okay. I'll take two operators. The first operator is a derivative operator, d, d, x. And this is why I said operators by themselves are meaningless because if you, if you ask me what is the property of d, d, x, I don't know but I know what d dx on x square is, it is 2x. So I know how it acts on some function. By itself, it is just a mathematical object, that is all. So second operator b, I'll just take x, okay? So what are these two operators? If I multiply, if I act b on some function f of x, then I simply get x times f of x. If I act the operator a on some f of x, I get df by dx, right? So a acting on f is df dx and b acting on f is x times f of x. Okay, so uh, as an aside, this is a notational aside, notation. Sometimes I might denote df over dx as f prime of x and df over dt as f dot of t, okay? Um, I'll mostly just expand this out and write it as df dx or uh, df dt, but in case I use these symbols, uh, you should know what it means. f prime is derivative with respect to space and f dot is derivative with respect to time. You may also see many books that employ this notation, so it might be useful for you to know what it means. Okay. So I told you that the order of operations is very important. So what does this mean? So let us take these two uh, operators as an example. The derivative operator dx and the position operator x. And let me act it on some uh, function f of x. So first I will act a, b on f of x. Okay, and then I will act b, a, on f of x, and then I will try to understand if these two are the same or not. Let us act b a on f of x first. What is this? b is just x, 
a is d d x and this acts on the function f of x. This is the order of operation. D, I put first, a, I put second, and then I put the function a. So this is simply x with d d x acting on f is just d d x, d f d x, which is f prime of x. Okay, so b a acting on f of x, forgive me, this keeps growing, uh, is simply x times f of x. So what is a? b acting on f of x a is d d x b is x and this is acting on f of x now we should be very careful <coughs> excuse me because the d d x is not just acting on f of x it is also acting on x okay so because b times f of x is x times f of x now d d x should not just act on f of x but it should, it should act on everything that is to the right of d d x so this gives us x times f prime of x using the chain rule of differentiation plus f of x. Okay. So now we can ask what is this quantity a b minus b a acting on f of x, which is basically the difference between these two equations, and this is simply f. If I take this minus this, I only get f of x. These two factors, x, x, f prime of x, get cancelled. So this quantity, a, b minus b, a, has a name. And this name is called a commutator of two operators. Commutator. Its definition is a, b minus b a okay so the commutator of two operators d d x and x is one okay so you can uh, try to evaluate the commutator compute the commutator let us say i h bar d d x and x or the commutator of or x comma i h bar d d x one of those two doesn't matter okay this is related to the famous heisenberg uncertainty relation and we will explain what this means as we go okay so just like matrices do not commute operators in quantum mechanics also in general do not commute while matrices not commuting is just an everyday fact operators not commuting in quantum mechanics has profound implications and we will understand what these implications are uh, when we are done with the, discussing the postulates of quantum mechanics okay so just like we um, discussed the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of matrices we can also talk about the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of operators eigenvalues and now, not eigenvectors, but I should use the word eigenfunctions of operators. We will explicitly tell you what these are as we, uh, as we go along in this course. So, the formal mathematical definition is exactly the same. A acting on some phi of x is some lambda times phi of x. This is the eigenvalue equation for the operator A. Phi of x are called the eigenfunctions. And lambda, obviously, the eigenvalues. Okay, this is the eigenvalue equation of uh, A. So, just like uh, the vectors had very nice properties, like I can take the dot product of two vectors, and I can claim that if uh, the dot product of two vectors is uh, uh, zero, the vectors are orthogonal to each other. And I can also write down a special class of matrices called Hermitian matrices, which are always equal to the self-adjoint, uh, which are always self-adjoint. Can I export all these notions in the, to the space of functions, okay? So this is a very interesting and important concept. Okay. So what would, what does one mean by when one says that two functions are orthogonal? Just like there is a dot product of vectors, 
can one write down a dot product of functions? Okay. Fortunately for us, mathematicians have worked this out and said that yes, it is indeed possible. Again, the mathematical basis for what I'm going to say uh, uh, lies deep in the theory of differential operators. But we will not uh, go into such things. If you have a chance to understand these, for example, what is called the sturm liouville problem in, in, in differential operators and differential uh, equations course that you would do with uh, mathematic, mathematicians, uh, that will be very useful to you. Anyway, for our purposes, we will simply define the dot product of two functions. And our functions, just like our vectors, can also be complex valued. So I'll assume in general that the functions are complex valued functions. So suppose if I have two functions, f of x and g of x, I can take the dot product of these two functions, which I will define, this is a definition that is given to you as integral f of x star g of x dx. Okay. Straight away you say that you see that uh, there is a some slight difference with respect to uh, dot products of vectors, which is actually very, very simple um, because the dot product of two vectors is basically an act of multiplying two vectors to give you a number, right? So in a similar fashion, you need to be able to multiply two vectors and get a number out. Uh, if I put some limits here, assuming that my region of integration, region in which the physical system lives is from minus infinity to plus infinity, then I can use minus infinity to plus infinity. If I'm looking at an object that is constrained to move between say x is equal to zero and x is equal to three, then my limits in this integration for that particular problem will be x is equal to zero to x is equal to three. So the limits of the integration depends upon the problem in question. So right now I'm assuming that I, I'm living all over the x space, minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? So if that is the case, this is my definition of the dot product of two functions, okay? Straight away note that the dot product of two functions taken in this direction is not the same as the dot product of two functions taken in the opposite, uh, opposite way, g dot f is basically minus infinity to infinity. I always complex conjugate the first guy, so this would be g star of x times f of x dx, okay? So you can easily guess that f dot g is basically g dot f complex conjugate. Okay, the dot product of two functions also has some very nice properties. f dot alpha g plus beta h, where alpha and beta are numbers and g and h are functions. This is given by, this is also a linear relation, alpha times f dot g plus beta times f dot h. Okay. Now, what about the uh, dot product of a function with itself? F dot F. Now, this F dot F by definition is minus infinity to infinity F star X, F of X dx, which is basically minus infinity to infinity F square dx, right? So you would recognize that f square integral f square dx with uh, something I talked about in the last uh, module when I discussed postulate one as square integrability. So this integral minus infinity to infinity f square dx has to make sense as an integral for me to work with these functions f of x, right? So if this f of x were indeed a wave function for some physical system, then this integral should make sense. Just like v dot v, which is uh, the modulus v squared, is the uh, length of the vector v, I can sort of interpret f dot f s in some weird way as the length of the function f. But we don't usually call, call it the length of a function f because the function is not necessarily a vector. But we demand that this f dot f is non-zero and positive and does not blow up. In this limits minus infinity to infinity, assuming I'm working in the full region of space, this in integral should not blow up and it should have a well-defined answer. So I'll assume that I'm only working with such classes of functions. Okay, so this, which is 
denoted as modulus or, or length, which is in two square brackets, f square, is always greater than zero. Okay, for all functions f of x that are not equal to zero. If f of x is equal to zero, obviously length uh, f dot f is also equal to zero. Of course, if I'm sticking only with real functions and not complex functions, f dot g is basically minus infinity to infinity f of x, g of x, dx. There is no complex conjugation anywhere. This is only valid for real valued functions. But in general, I'm, I'm also interested in functions that have uh, complex values. So the general uh, definition I will employ is this. Okay. So just like we discussed the adjoint of operate uh, of matrices, the adjoint, remember the adjoint of a matrix was a star transpose, which we had a very cute symbol as dagger. Right? This was the adjoint of a matrix. So <clears throat> I would like to export the notion of adjointness to the operators also but how do i do it because i have i don't have a vector i i don't i don't have a matrix i have a function so what does the notion of transpose even mean so i need to be able to understand how i can write write down and define the adjoint of an operator so my job is to define the adjoint of an operator okay so it is not mathematically straightforward because I don't have a vector. So I cannot simply do transposes. There is no rows or columns. Uh, DDX, for example, is an operator. So I can ask what is the adjoint of DDX, right? So I cannot say DDX star transpose. That, that makes no sense. I need to understand how to uh, figure this out. So here's my definition of uh, the adjoint definition. The adjoint, adjoint of a linear operator A, and I will again denote this by denoted by a dagger even though I will remind you this A dagger is not simply related to A by A star transpose. That is only true for matrices. So in the case of differential operators and operators acting on function, A dagger and A are simply not related by complex conjugation followed by transpose because it is something to transpose. These are not matrices. So the adjoint of a linear operator A is the linear operator such that the adjoint of a uh, operator is also a linear operator for all functions f of x and g of x it satisfies f of x dot product a acting on g of x is the same as a dagger f of x dot product g of x. Okay, so on the left hand side, let's uh, make this explicit and then I will tell you what's going on here. This is the dot product of f and a g. And this is the dot product of a dagger f and g. Okay. Notice that I could have also called the adjoint of a linear operator the operator b instead of a dagger if it confuses you. Right. So in the case of operators acting on function, I will take this equality. Okay. I will take this as the definition of a linear operator, and then I will use this definition to figure out what the adjoint of an operator is. So unlike the case of a matrix where given a matrix, I can simply understand what its 
adjoint is by just complex commutating and transposing. In the case of operators acting on function, the procedure is a little more involved. It's a little more involved because you have to first use this rule as the definition of what a of what the adjoint of an operator is, and then use this rule to figure out what a dagger is. So given a, what is a dagger? So let us actually work out an example if this sounds a little confusing. What is the rule? The rule says that if you, have, if you pick two random functions, f of x and g of x, and if you take the dot product of f of x and g, a times g of x, how do we take this dot product? This is basically equal to minus infinity to infinity, assuming that you are living all over space. Uh, the uh, complex conjugate of the first equation, or of the first function, excuse me, times the second function dx. Okay. Similarly, this is the complex conjugate of the first function, which is a dagger f of x times g of x dx. That is how you do the integration. So, which is the, the rule basically says that if you take the dot product of f and a gx or the dot product of a dagger f and gx, and if these two are the same, then you can claim that a dagger is the adjoint of a. So uh, I, I realize this might be a little confusing. So, but if we work out an example, I'm sure you'll be able to see what's going on. Okay, so here's an example. Example. Uh, let's take the uh, differential operator DDX again. DDX I'm uh, using over and over again, uh, simply because DDX is related to what is called the momentum operator in quantum mechanics, and it's a very important operator in quantum mechanics. So let me ask the question, what is the adjoint of the operator A equal to DDX um, in, let us say, um, some space, a, B. That is, X belongs in the interval A comma B. Okay. So I'm sure mathemat mathematics teachers have told you that if I put a square back, it means that the limits are included. So between A and B, I'm only interested in the region where X goes from A to B, not minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, you, will, you will see the, re the reason I took A and B, uh, it will bring out a subtlety. Minus infinity, infinity, in some sense, it's actually a little easy. So suppose if I'm only into, if my physical system is only in the interval A and B, and if I'm looking at this operator TDX, what is the adjoint of this operator? Okay. So for example, as an example of a physical system, suppose if we have a quantum mechanical pendulum. Okay. So a pendulum whose uh, bobs a quantum mechanical object. Okay? So it's called the simple harmonic oscillator, right? Uh, it only moves from, let us say, one extreme. Classically, it moves from one extreme to the other extreme. Quantum mechanically, this is called a bound system. We'll talk about bound systems later. So in this case, I'm not interested in going all the way from x is equal to minus infinity and x is equal to plus infinity because I know that even classically, the simple pendulum bob is not going to be found at x is equal to minus infinity or plus infinity. I'm only interested in some region of space. So it is perfectly reasonable to ask this question. So what is the adjoint of operators in some region of space? This region of space could also be minus infinity and infinity. I'll just simply put A equal to minus infinity and B equal to plus infinity. Okay. So let us investigate by, claim, uh, by figuring out what A dagger is for DDX. What is the A dagger that actually follows this particular rule? Okay. So let us evaluate the left-hand side of this rule explicitly. The left-hand side is basically f of x times a g of x. So I'll also assume a real, um, a real functions f of x and g of x for convenience. So a and b, f of x. If this were complex valued, I'll put f star here, but I'm assuming it's a real valued function, times d dx of g of x dx. Okay, this is my left hand side. Now I want to massage this into something that puts the f of x under the derivative times g of x. The way I would do it is by doing uh, what is, uh, I'm, I'm sure familiar to you as uh, integration by parts. How do I do it? 
this is this is equal to if this is my u and this is my dv this will be equal to f of x times g of x between the limits b and a minus integral a to b df dx times g of x dx. Okay. Now here comes the important point. So this uh, second term that I have here is basically minus d dx acting on f of x times g of x. Okay. So if I interpret this as some a dagger f times g, then this a dagger is equal to minus d dx. And I think that is uh, clear to you, right? Because the same rule, a dagger f times g of x, where a is my d dx, if, my, if I choose my a dagger as minus d dx, then a times, um, sorry, a f times g, which is my left hand side, is the same as a dagger f times g. But that is not quite true because I also have what is called a boundary term here. Okay. So defining the adjunct of operators becomes a more complicated business because not only have, we have to make sure that this equation is satisfied, but this equation can be satisfied only for certain classes of functions, which also don't have this kind of a boundary term. So for example, if my f of x and g of x are such that f of x equal to zero and x equals a and b. Okay, I should, so I should only operate this on such classes of functions that have f of x equal to zero at x equal to a and b. Uh, then the boundary term is manifestly absent. If I restrict myself, for example, uh, if you have any well-behaved function and if a and b are minus infinity and infinity, this is certainly true because functions don't grow at x is equal to minus infinity and infinity, they typically die down. So the boundary term, if a equal to minus infinity and b equal to plus infinity is e equal to zero for functions that are well-behaved. Well-behaved in this context means the functions are square integrable. Square integrable means that this integral makes sense. This integral will not make sense if the function keeps growing at plus minus infinity, right? The function should typically die down at plus minus infinity. So for most square, for square integrable wave functions, and if I choose a equal to minus infinity and b equal to plus infinity, this boundary term should naturally vanish. But if I choose a finite boundary, uh, you have to be cognizant of the boundary terms in general. In a finite boundary, f and g might not be might not be going to zero at the boundaries. So only if f and g go to zero at the boundaries, can I define the notion of an adjoint for the operator ddx. If this condition is valid, then I can claim that the adjoint of the operator ddx in this space, x is equal to a comma b is the operator minus d dx. So notice that the adjoint for a operator acting on a function is not very simply related to it, the original operator, like in the case of a matrix. So um, a priori, we would not have been able to guess the adjoint of d dx is minus d dx. Okay. So this is something to keep in mind. This depends on a couple of factors. It depends on the boundary term also vanishing. If the boundary term does not vanish, then on the space of this functions, the operator ddx does not have an adjoint. If the boundary term vanishes, then I can define the adjoint of a ddx as minus ddx. So this uh, puts restrictions on the class of functions I can also choose. I cannot choose any random set of functions and add them on ddx and claim that there is an equivalent adjoint operation. If there isn't, only if I choose those classes of functions that vanish at the boundaries, can I have uh, an, the adjoint of an operator properly defined? So a Hermitian operator, 
Hermitian operator is one for which the A dagger that you get by this rule is the same as the A that you have. If A dagger is the same as A, not in the sense of matrices, but in the sense of this rule. Suppose if you go through this machinery of calculation, and if you find, if I find uh, at the end that this is also plus DDX, I will claim that DDX is a Hermitian operator. But clearly, DDX is not a Hermitian operator because the adjoint of DDX is minus DDX. But if it turns out that A equal to A dagger, then such an operator is called a Hermitian operator. Okay. Um, so uh, a good exercise for you would be to compute, this is an exercise, compute uh, the adjoint of the operator A equals, instead of DDX, let us choose minus I DDX. Okay, this is an exercise for you. So take this as an exercise. Uh, is in the same space A to B, assuming that the functions all vanish, and now work with complex valued functions. Okay, don't just use real functions, use complex valued functions. Uh, F star and G star also are, uh, are not the same as F and G, and try to compute uh, what the uh, Hermitian conjugate of this operator is. Okay, uh, if, you have, if you are successful in this, do it for a second operator B, which is a second derivative operator. Just check to see if um, d square over dx square is a Hermitian operator. Okay. Now, in this course, I will use the words Hermitian and self adjoint interchangeably. Okay. Uh, but there are subtle differences between what a Hermitian operator is and self adjoint operator is, but I will ignore these subtleties in this course. Okay. So, uh, I realize that uh, I have given a lot for you to work and think about. So basically, if we just go through what we have done today, basically our initial goal was very simple. We wanted to understand what to do with the wave functions and quantum mechanics to get information about the system in our system that we're investigating. And it turns out that the only way we can get information about the system is if we do something to these wave functions, if we push them, pull them, twist them, rotate them, do something. So we have to be able to understand mathematically how to push, pull, and uh, twist these wave functions. And to do that, we have to understand the notion of operators acting on wave functions. And it turns out that one can understand the operators acting on wave functions using some familiar examples uh, in terms of matrices acting on vectors. So that's what we initially did. We looked uh, at, uh, excuse me, on this page. We looked at the concept of uh, matrices acting on vectors to give you new vectors and we exported this concept to, to quantum mechanics and matrices have some very nice properties like you know you can diagonalize them and things like that and vectors also have some nice properties you can orthogonalize them normalize them so we exported these definitions also to wave functions and may operators at quantum mechanics but we found that the exp uh, export is not very uh, straightforward we have to make certain changes the changes that we have to make are redefine our notion of what dot product of two vectors are in the space of functions. So we define the dot product of two functions in this particular fashion. And we claim that just, just like the length of a vector is a finite quantity, the dot product of the same function with itself, f dot f, should be a finite quantity and should not blow up. And this is called a square integrable function. And just like we can define the adjoint of a matrix, we have to define the adjoint of an operator also. And this turns out to be a slightly more complicated situation where you have to uh, assume that the adjoint of an operator is one for which this particular rule that is visible to you on this slide holds true. So assuming that this holds true, you have to figure out what a dagger is that makes this equation hold. So we went through an example of DDX in some space and figured out that as long as I'm restricting myself with functions that die down at the boundaries, I can interpret minus DDX as the adjoint of DDX. Okay, so with this information, I um, can conclude that DDX is not a, not a Hermitian operator in this space. So I uh, invite you to calculate uh, to do two simple calculations, try to compute the adjoint of minus i dx and the adjoint of 
the second derivative operator d square over dx square. So we will stop at this stage for today. And uh, in the next lecture, we will continue our discussion of operators a little more and then introduce a second postulate of quantum mechanics that will help clarify uh, why is it that we talk a lot about operators and how operators are actually related to uh, physical measurements that we make in the laboratory. Okay, so we'll stop here and take it up uh, in the next next module.